Hello everyone, it's that time again where I get to re-examine my extraordinary body of work. Or rather, Eli gets to re-examine it because he's pulled out some old comedy pieces that I've done on television, on English television and on American television. As you all know, really and truly, what I do very well is mean, evil, wicked, horrible, cruel. I haven't played an assassin. Oh, I have played an assassin. I did play an assassin because I hung out of a helicopter in Hong Kong once on Spitfire. Anyway, that's by the by because this is not about me being horrible. This is about me being sweet and amusing and lovely. It's a bit of a stretch. Anyway, I started my career, as you all by now, I'm sure know, when I was about 19 or 20, in a sci-fi movie called The Final Programme and did a lot of those sort of genre of films. Meanwhile, I was trying very hard to get some little bits of comedy work, not very easy, and certainly when years passed it was practically impossible because by then I really was Evil Wicked Queen. Anyway, so I was very grateful to get anything, but suffice to say the kind of comedy stuff I got when I was in my early 20s was really and truly, comedy back then was very corny, and looking at these pieces I did telephone Eli yesterday and say I can't talk about them because they're so ghastly. However, I'm going to take a deep breath and tell you that I did a thing called Howard Confessions with a very well-known comedian here called Frankie Howard. I was very English, I was frankly English and talked like that and it was all terribly good fun. Deirdre's coming later with some friends. Oh, splendid! Mm. Oh, I'm trapped. Thank you. I tell you what, they're not going to be here for a little while yet, so why don't we make some tea? Mm. Oh, Deirdre, how nice. Your friends have arrived. Yes, this is Melissa. Hello. Ludovic Hello. and... Uh, Francis Howard. Oh, hello. Francis, we met in Mexico. Yes, by the reservoir, it was a full tilt at the time. <laughs> yes. Won't you take your things off and make yourselves comfortable? Mm. Now, I wonder how they get started. Free, everyone! Oh. Oh, lots of fish paste sandwiches! Well, that should whip us into a frenzy, shouldn't it? I did quite a few of those sorts of jobs. I did Howard Confessions, and then I did a ghastly thing called room service. Lots of negligees, I seem to remember. And I was seducing um, Matthew Kelly, I think it was. Poor boy, terrified of me. Not half as terrified as I was, because again, I was still frightfully keen and there was a lot of heaving bosoms and cleavage and that sort of stuff. Would you like a drink? Oh, uh, no thank you, madam. We're not allowed to drink with the guests. Oh, you're one of the good ones, are you? Oh, well... <laughs> not, um, too good, I hope. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you get my note? Uh, no. No, I didn't. Well, never mind. You're here now. So why don't we just have a glass of champagne and relax? But to go off duty in half an hour. Ooh, that should be long enough. <laughs> so, I wasn't thrilled about the early comedy, but then somewhere in the midst of my Superman filming, and I think it was in the year when I had a bit of a hiatus from Superman and then we came back to it. I got a job on a series called Thundercloud. Now this was exciting because number one, I was the only girl. I played a character called Bella Harrington. I was the vicar's daughter and I got to ride a horse. And as many of you know, I had horses when I was younger. The whole family, we were always a bit horsey. So I was very, very excited. I was also delighted to be working with James Cosmo, who is a well-known actor now, and he was just, he was fabulous then, but now you will particularly know him from Game of Thrones. And it was set during the war years, and we are assuming that the Admiralty misunderstood and thought that HMS Thundercloud was a ship away at sea, when in fact it was a land base. So dear old Jimmy was up to no good at all, because every time the supplies came in to the ship, he was off selling them on the black market. Anyway, the lead actor, John Fraser, he was my love interest. He was also considerably shorter than me, rather like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who you would think was taller than me, but I can tell him he's not. Anyway, I remember very clearly, because whenever we did a scene together, they had a little box that he stood on, and I always thought it was terribly sweet, because he went up and down, up and down in height. Anyway, the point of this whole story is that I played this character, and it was wonderful for me because it was, I suppose you could almost term it black comedy, it, there was no audience and I think I'm right in saying it was the first time they had done a situation comedy in England without a live audience so we had to rely on you, the public, to get the joke at home. 
I don't know if you did get it. I got it though. My mum got it. She always got it. Anyway, so I was Bella and I was forever pursuing dear old John. And one of the things that happened every week was that he would have a fantasy and he would go to sleep and he would fantasise about Bella, the vicar's daughter, headscarf on a horse, terribly proper, and also terribly keen. I was still terribly keen back then. He would fantasise about me in different guises. You're not very loyal to your girlfriend. She is not my girlfriend. Even if I hadn't renounced him and company for the duration of the war. Rather you than me. I, I wouldn't be likely to choose Miss Harrington. Especially... Now I know her for what she is. One kiss, Fraulein, I beg. In return for what, Doctor? The plans of the secret new battleship. Such a big boat for a kiss. Oh, I'm your slave, you know that. As all men are my slaves, my beauty drives you mad. Your desire for me is... Makes him forget his duty. Admiral! Oh, ah! You fiend. All men forget their duty in my presence. There are some who put their country first. No one can resist me. You too are a man. A free Englishman. And no slave to foreign flesh. I'll take that battleship from its harbor. I warn you, Admiral. Touch me but once. And your soul is mine forever. You think I'll succumb to your evil like that pathetic little wretch? No matter. I'm not so weak. You'll find me a strong enemy. Such coldness. Such icy English control. Can it be that at last I've met my match? I do. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I've got all sorts of different characters, so it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And again, because it was a naval base, it was all men, it was all sailors, and me. They spoiled me rotten, the lovely Derek Waring. Oh my goodness me, they did spoil me, and I loved it. Wilmot hasn't had good wine for a time. I forget what it tastes like. My half glass was splendid. Mm. I must say, the more one drinks of it. Evidently. Ah, oh, uh, yeah. still, it was a fine compliment to an excellent piece of pork. Grouse. Was it? Oh, but <laughs> my little joke. Mm -hmm. Now, just as an aside, because I can tell you these things, interestingly enough, this series was created by a man called In. Macintosh. Now I haven't said that name in a long time because he's no longer with us. But back then he was the producer and he wrote it. He'd also written a series called Warship and lots of work to do with spying. It was well known that he was in the Navy and he had also worked for British intelligence in a spying capacity. And I met him on Warship as did Jimmy Cosmo and he must have remembered me and him because we were brought back to do Thundercloud. Anyway this rather quiet character, Ian, who was not that much older than me, but a very nice man, but a man of few words would be on the set every day. And we filmed on this base that did exist, which in those days was the heart of British intelligence, this area of the north of England. And on the next hill was the American listening base, very famous for being the intelligence centre, and they had those great big globe things that they listened to. Do you know what I mean? Every week we did an episode and you'd be piped on board just as if you were on board ship and everything ran as if it was a ship. And we have real sailors as well, well real sailors as extras and it was a great fabulous job. I did 13 episodes and this was it for me, I was thrilled and looking forward to doing the next series. We had a break at the end of the 13 episode and I would like to say as it can only happen to me and I don't mean to make very little of this but the significance of what I'm going to tell you is that Ian in that break, decided to take himself off on holiday with his girlfriend and his best friend and they took a small light aircraft and they went out over the Alaskan Straits and mysteriously disappeared. 
sent out a May Day. Immediately the Americans sent out Coast Guards, they sent out everything to look for wreckage of the plane. Nothing was ever seen. And here we all are many, many years later with some massive speculation as to what really happened to Ian. Now, as I said, the awful thing is that he disappeared along with his girlfriend and the other man. The awful thing for me was he disappeared with all the scripts for the next season. I mean, just my bad luck, how very typical. I hope he hasn't disappeared into the waters of the Alaskan Sea, but there's a lot of mystery concerned there. So if you fancy those sort of conspiracy theory type things, you should Google him because it's fascinating stuff and he really did disappear and it was very odd. He shouldn't have gone. Everybody said it. The whole thing was very odd. But with it went Thunderclap. So that was the end of Thunderclap. So Superman came, Superman went and I went to America. So by 83 I was in America and as you know Falcon Crest and V and my usual stuff and then suddenly out of the blue popped up Remington Steel. Now Remington Steel was a real joy because Firstly, Pierce Brosnan is just absolutely gorgeous and delightful. And sadly at the time, his wife, who I knew, was due to play his wife in the story. And sadly she fell ill and later died. And so I was called in to play his wife, which of course was great fun. And we went off to Ireland and we shot in Dublin, which was brilliant. It was kind of slapsticky, that one. I mean, I was pushed and shoved into closets and under beds and under sheets. And also in that was a wonderful American comedic actress called Doris Roberts. I mean, it really was very, very lighthearted and right up my street. And by then I'd stopped being oh, awfully good, sort of rather like Joyce Grenville. For those of you who know Joyce Grenville, it's, and I had lowered my pitch a little bit, thank God, because the Americans just couldn't understand me. I had to get a bit serious and drop my toe. I wasn't going to drop my accent. And Pierce Brosnan was an absolute delight. And again, a lot of negligees and sort of sexy outfits. But at least it showed a little bit of what I could do other than being a bad girl. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What's <sighs> China? Oh, I was in the neighborhood and I thought I'd pop round. Oh. Last time I saw you was in Hong Kong. And that was five years ago. <sighs> Aren't you glad to see me? Oh, beside myself with joy. Uh, unfortunately, I'm expecting guests. I've missed you so much, Douglas. The bedroom. Oh, I love it when you take charge. You can't be found here, not tonight. Oh, if I am as quiet as a mouse, um, do, do I get a reward? Oh. A big reward? Oh, yeah. Coming! It's okay. Don't worry. How I got there? No! Need some help? No! No! It started in Paris, I remember. It was raining. It always rains in Paris in the spring. Save that thought. Oh. There, you see? All tidied. Where was I? In Paris, being rained on. Oh, oh, that's where I met him. I was foolish to think that I could ever forget you, but what was I to do? Duck. What about the duck? It's almost ready. Mm. Come in. Oh. Shannon, I think it's time you knew. I've just returned from my honeymoon. Perfect. The wife's always the last to know. What? As much as I admire your respect for tradition, I'm afraid it's a Jew. Oh, Douglas, I've flown 6,000 miles to, to throw myself at your feet. Yeah, and I appreciate the gesture. There's no one prettier prostrate than you, but I'm afraid we're all we're left without oh. memories. Oh, if that's the way you feel, then it really is a Jew. That's what I've always liked about you. You've always been a good sport. Ah, Mildred. I'm not late, am I? Actually, uh, you're early. Oh. The kitchen, quick, quick, straight through. That's it, my girl. That's it. Oh, yes. Oh, thing just right over here. Okay, hunker down, hunker down. As soon as the coast is clear, make a beeline for the door, okay? If you're sure it'll make you happy. It's static. So Remington Steel was great, and I did a couple of episodes of that, and returned to America, and there were all sorts of other things going on, but I remember one of the great things that I so loved doing was Sledgehammer. Now, Sledgehammer, again, was my sort of humour, because it was rather tongue-in-cheek. David Rashi was the star of it, and I got to play a rather femme fatale, nothing new there. 
and another character who played his imaginary Humphrey Bogart friend and we had such a laugh doing it and I absolutely adored it. Another instance where I was wearing a fur coat with nothing on underneath, all fur and no knickers. Did my mother used to say that? Mr. Hammer. Mr. Sledgehammer. The same. Can I take your coat? Well, sorry, but I'm naked underneath. Then I insist on taking your coat. You're cute. But um, I just came from posing for the life drawing class at the university doing my part for higher education. Makes me want to go back to school. Get to it. I can't do that. I just met her. No, I mean, find out what the caper is. Right, right. Are you talking to someone? No, no, no. I was mumbling. <laughs> so, what makes you think you need a private eye, Mrs. Carstairs? My husband's body was found washed up on the beach. He'd been lying there for a week. So I guess he was dead, right? I kicked actors out of my movies for saying stupid things like that. Just ask her how her husband was killed. He'd been strangled with seaweed. I was just going to ask you that. Sounds fishy to me. If he was lying on a beach for a week... Yeah, how come nobody said anything? About what? Oh, come on, Mrs. Carstairs. How could your husband be lying dead on a beach for a week and yet not one person reported it? Well, he had such a great tan that nobody noticed him. Dead. I had to do it. He was going to kill me. You know this man? It's my attorney. They're grating. Where'd you get the gun? It's my husband's. Well, if he had a gun, why did you hire me? I didn't know if I could kill anyone. <laughs> now you know. Hold it, Hammer. Make sure she knows you don't give refunds. <laughs> But the whole thing was, all of the comedy I did seemed to be around me being rather tall and having a cleavage and being rather English, and they, the Americans loved all that. But what they really loved was the cut glass accent. And as I said, I was speaking like I'm speaking now, that there were moments where people remembered, I was terribly like that. And so when the opportunity came, now what was that show called? Almost Home. And they wanted me just to be frightfully like this and so I, I did this wonderful little segment just a scene and it was the first time that I did a proper sitcom in America in front of a live audience in fact it was the I think it was the only time I'd done a live audience and so it was wonderful and I did that sort of terribly quick and awfully like that and it was all very exciting and I loved doing it and nobody could understand a word I said Oh, this salad is delicious. Would you mind passing the pepper, please? I just love British accents. Y'all manage to make the most ordinary thing sound so elegant. I bet you could say, there's a hole in my sock and make it sound classy. <laughs> Go on, say there's a hole in my sock. No, don't. Well, actually, there is a hole in my sock. <laughs> I guess you don't darn your hubby socks. And I have something to do that for us. <laughs> See. What did she just say? I have no idea. <laughs> no, we're getting back to my perspective. Yours I... is the accent that fascinates me, but I can't seem to place it. Oklahoma. Pyramid Corners, Oklahoma. Charming, absolutely charming. Wasn't it, my dear? <laughs> did you catch any of it that time? Not a word. <laughs> Lobster. Now, we don't have lobsters in Oklahoma. We have crawl daddies, but they don't get this big except down by the nuclear power plant. <laughs> Ooh, I love this song. Then allow me to do the honor. Well, if it's all right with your wife. Eh, why don't I know? I'll take that as a yes. Allow me. Would you care to dance, Lady Harrington? Ah, I can't go in there. Oh, well. Give me your lady. Her lady, I'm going to roll her. Yeah, there you go. Come here now. Oh, my dear. Oh, my dear. 
You have to excuse us, but what did she just say? Damned if I know. So now we're crawling through the 80s. I don't know whether it was the 90s when I did the fine romance, is what it was called in America, but in England they called it Ticket to Ride. And a slightly coddy, weirdy, Eastern European accent from me. I can't say it was one of my better accents. Periodically, the beautiful vowels came out. But Nicola Provost, who's a fabulous actor here in England, and I made some wonderful long-time friends whilst shooting this. And we went to... Did we go to Budapest or Bucharest? Hmm, there's the rub, Budapest, which was fabulous. And I loved it. See, I love going on location. And it was very funny, very slapsticky. A lot of dead bodies in freezers and arms coming out and slapping me in the face and going back. And a lot of giggles. And really, the most fun for me. I don't know about the audience, but it was the most fun for me. Not so Pull yourself together, Laszlo. My wife is dead. We have nothing to fear, my little Chipetka. We did not kill her. Dead? Before the insurance policy has been issued? They are waiting for our medical records. Yes, yes, yes. Now, did you put her in a deep freeze, as I told you? With a veal cutlet. You know how much veal cost is? 300 farts a pound? Where do you shop? Warsaw? <laughs> Soon we'll have all the money we want, Galushka. And this time, you won't gamble it away as you did your wife's money, huh? What money, Emma? There is no insurance policy and Dagmar is dead. She will keep where she is until the policy comes. In the meantime, we will switch her electron encephalograph with that of a healthy woman. <laughs> It. The gone. 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 Oh, calm down, my little Laborka. We will take her to the spa. As a special dietary consultant, I have unquestioned access to the meat locker. We will put her there. Do you have any cellophane? Cellophane? Plastic. Yes! on a film called Monster Mash. It used to be called Frankenstein Sings. And this was just a blast. From the minute I started on it, I had the best time. I loved the outfits, I loved the whole thing. The only thing that they had neglected to ask me, they invited me along to do it, which was lovely, I was excited. Um, they obviously invited me on the assumption that I could sing and dance. Um, nobody actually thought to ask me about that. So when I appeared on the set the very first day, with all the producers and different people and the designers and all the people that are involved sat around this big rehearsal room to watch us all be put through our paces. So when they said, Miss Douglas, would you like to give us your movements across the floor? Which I thought, oh, man. and I got my old sneakers on. So they said, no, not in your sneakers, in your high heels. I don't wear high heels. So I went up on my tippy toe and I couldn't 
think of anything, I have to move graciously. Now, anybody that knows me well knows that one of the things I don't do is move very graciously. I clump and I fall over and I bump into the furniture. It's just who I am. There you are. Except in Superman. Didn't do it in Superman, which is why I was so good. Anyway, so here I am and they said, would you move from one side of the studio to the other side and show us your graceful movements? Well, I couldn't think of anything to, to do as far as moving, except for the brief moment that I was at drama school, at the Rose Bruford School of Drama, before they tactfully told me they didn't think I was equipped to be an actress. Funny that, after my first year. Um, but in that first year, I was taught six basic Greek arm line movements. Now, how useful is that? Six basic Greek arm line movements. And so I started to do these as I headed across the floor, my arms out, my arms stretched, and again, high up on my tippy toes so that I looked tall and looked as if I was in high heels. And one of the producers was eating an apple back behind me, and I caught him out the side of my eye. He looked a little bit bored, quite honestly, which is why I noticed him. And off I went in my movement, and then suddenly he threw that apple at the back of my leg and he hit it. I mean, I just thought, and I went, oh. anyway. It transpired that no, he hadn't turned the apple. I had actually ripped my Achilles tendon from A being stiff and being on tiptoe. So immediately the dance routines were out. I was rushed off to the hospital to be checked out. I had to have, I don't know, I didn't have plaster. I don't know what I had around my leg, but they couldn't show it anymore. So suddenly my gowns became very long and I sort of glumped. As any of you that have seen this film that comes out every Halloween, somebody goes and sees it again. There's a lot of me doing not too dainty dancing. Anyway, they quickly said, don't worry, Sarah, don't worry. So the dancing isn't so good. We'll go into the studio and you can sing. And at that point I went, hmm, okay. And I think it's fair to say my singing leaves a little to be desired. I sounded a little bit like a cross between Eartha Kitt and Rex Harrison, for all of you oldies that know who I mean. I sort of spoke the words with a little bit of tune behind. Rocky Horror Show had been a great success and I think these people thought they were going to come up with the same sort of thing. Sadly, it didn't quite hit the heights of Rocky Horror Show, but it hit my heights. And it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience and still to this date, I love it. I told you, Dr. Frankenstein, she is all mine. Who's all yours, my dear? Oh, uh... Not now, Natasha. I'm busy. Is he trying to cheat on me again? Nonsense! I've been watching you. I know that there's some young, pure girl in that bedroom. If that is true, may I be forced to shop exclusively on QVC? Hmm. Who's there? Hmm. Hope she likes cubic zirconium. If I find red lipstick on your collar one more time, I'm going to call for my lawyer. He's such a bloodsucker. Natasha! Honey, you should know by now, I have certain appetites that I must quench. Certain uncontrollable urges that I must meet. But when I'm with all those other girls, when I'm with all those other young, sexy, prepubescent, long-legged girls, when I'm with all those other bubbly, bouncy, high cheekbone, fresh veined, perky buttocks girls, I'm always thinking about you. Oh, Vladdy. You say the sweetest things. The moon is full tonight. Are we going out? Uh, there's been a change of plans. I knew it! We never go out anymore. We always eat in. I... Natasha. Baby cakes. Bad muffin. Oh. Before this night is through, we both will be satisfied. Cross my heart and hope to live. We're having Scott and Mary for dinner. Ooh. Ooh. That's more uh, like Na it. Natasha, stop being so vulgar. Hey, gorgeous. Rise and shine. No, Cindy. I think the mall is cute. It's not Cindy. And which mole do you like? <gasps> what are you doing here? Don't pretend you didn't feel that strange electricity between us at dinner. I thought that was just static cling. No. It was an overwhelming power drawing us together. I had to find you. 
to hold you, to touch you, to kiss you. I've got a girlfriend. Oh, don't be naive. You're not married yet? What she doesn't know won't hurt her. <gasps> don't waste the moment. Take me in your arms. Hold me. Crush me. Kiss me. What about your husband? You can kiss him later. Since then, there have been other little epics, and most of them we're going to forget about because we don't need to talk about them all. I am trying, but people in America, particularly in Hollywood, we mustn't forget, you get your little slot, you get your little cubby hole they put you into, and I was bitch, villain, evil, English, so right from the early 80s I slotted in there, so whenever they wanted a bad girl, um, they called on me. And it's still kind of the same now, obviously I'm an aged bad girl, I'm the granny that you don't want to take home, I guess, I don't know. But comedy-wise, it is my great joy and my great delight. And I hear every other actress on television say, well, I'd really like to do some comedy. Yeah, but I would really like to do some comedy. But having said that, um, if I don't ever get to do any comedy, and I'm just playing my evil, mean self on screen, you know that off the set, and in fact, even on the set, I'm having a good laugh, possibly at your expense, but certainly at my expense. So. Thank you all for listening. See you guys. Bye.